I bought these Thorogood 1957 boots so that I could try them myself, use them, and then cut them in half and take a look at what's actually on the inside of these boots. And I also bought a pair of used Thorogood 1957 boots, as you can see here, so that I could look at how the boot parts have worn down over time and also cut these used boots in half and compare how the inside of these boots holds up compared to that new thorough good that I bought. So let's take a look. So of course we have the wedge outsole. Again, we're going to talk about that in more detail in a little bit because thorough good uses a unique wedge outsole. They don't use the Vibram Christie, which I believe it's the Vibram Christie 4014 that a lot of the uh, wedge sole work boots use. They use their own wedge sole. There's a little bit of a difference there. We'll talk about that here in a bit. But above that, so when they construct this boot, this wedge outsole is, is glued to a, a flat layer there, another layer right above that, which is the midsole. And again, if you rotate this boot, you can see it really from the outside here. You can see you have your wedge outsole and then that little layer, that tan layer of rubber there. Now that's the midsole. And so when we rotate it back here, you can see that tan color right there running right above it. So the question is, how good is this rubber midsole? I'm going to give this rubber midsole a B grade, but it's important to understand that in this price range, all you're going to see is rubber midsole. So this is very common. The most premium type of midsole is a leather midsole and leather midsoles are good because they're they're very durable and long lasting and they eventually form to the to the shape of your foot and rubber doesn't do that rubber won't um, form to, to your foot it'll just you know stay as a, as a flat layer there but it's not going to eventually conform to the bottom of your foot but the benefit of rubber is one, it's cheaper, so they can offer cheaper to manufacture, so they can offer this boot at a at a better price point. But that rubber midsole is more flexible than leather, so it's a, it's easier to break in. And I I would give a, if a leather midsole is an A grade, this rubber midsole is a B grade. It's perfectly fine. There's nothing bad about this rubber midsole. I'm not going to give it a thumbs up just because it's it's just like every other midsole that you find in this price range. So that midsole isn't separating this boot, this $290 boot from a $150 boot. A $150 boot is using that same midsole, but it's actually what's above that midsole that starts to separate this boot from those lower priced boots. Okay, so above that rubber midsole, we have that layer here of cork which is also called a cork filler reason this is called a filler is when they last this boot they actually last it upside down and they pull this leather over the top and it gets hand hammered into place and that forms the shape in the in the fit of the boot but what's left on the bottom once they hammer that leather into place is a cavity in between where the leather is and so they fill in that leather cheaper boots will fill in that space with a foam but these boots are using one of the best materials that you can use to fill in that area which is cork the reason cork is so good is it's it's lightweight so it doesn't have a bunch of extra weight to the boot it's very flexible it breaks in easily but the the biggest the two biggest things that make this cork layer is so popular is it forms to the shape of your foot so it kind of gives you that after a little bit of wear it gives you that custom feel and another reason why it's really popular is it's resilient so it doesn't smash down to like a thin layer just after two months and that is really what separates this cork filler from the filler that you'll find in like a hundred dollar boot or 150 dollar boot a lot of those boots will use a cheap foam Sometimes maybe like a cheap cardboard. And again, that's kind of a hidden 
uh, material because from the outside, if you don't cut these boots open, you can't see this cork because this lasting board above it is sealed. And of course the outsole is underneath it. So a lot of boot companies will kind of, this is where they get you right here is this filler material because you can't see it. And if I just set this down for a second, here's a pair of $100 mock toe boots. I okay, so the video cut out, but here's this cheaper pair of mock toe boots that I bought for $100. And you can see this cheaper pair here is using wedge out sole and then there's that little rubber midsole right there just like in our Thurgood 1957 boots but above that see this is the area right here where they're getting you this is not cork this is a cheap foam and it just you know after wearing it it compresses and compresses and compresses and even after just a few months with these cheaper boots like this this foam layer here turns into just like a sheet of paper you lose all the resiliency of this foam and you're just basically left with no comfort underneath the foot other than the insole itself and a lot of times with these these uh, i don't know if we can see it up here but yeah we, we can see it a little bit with these foam fillers they're not always filled in well like the cork so the cork filler there you see how it doesn't have that gap in the front there's, there's no gap up there. It's just, it goes fill in perfectly all the way to the edge there, if I can get it to focus. And all the way here to the back. And that little area there, that's the, the shank. So that's, that's the composite shank. We'll talk about that here in a second. But you can see you don't have any of those gaps. And if we take a look at that cheaper boot again, you've got that, that huge gap there in the front. And that, it, it can cause this this filler this foam filler to slide back and forth and like bunch up and it's just not quality material to use in the boot it's not long lasting and so again this is a hundred dollar boot and now we're looking at the Thurgood 1957 which is i bought mine for 290 so this is one of the areas of the boot that separates it from that cheaper boot is that is that cork filler i want to talk just to be fair about this cork and just say that this cork isn't necessarily going to last forever. Yes, it's the best filler material that you find in this price range, but it's still, if you put a thousand miles on this boot, yes, this cork is going to smash thin. It's not going to smash as thin as foam or like cheap cardboard, cardboard will, but it is going to th uh, become thinner. And this is important because if you, you know, when you go in to get your, boot resold let's just say you take it to a cobbler and you say hey throw me a new outsole on here all they're going to do is they're going to cut off this this outsole and they're just going to sand it down smooth sand that midsole area down then they're going to glue a new outsole on top and so you have a fresh outsole but the cork did not get freshened right you still have that original cork and you also have the option when you go in there you can say hey i you know i want that i want that cork root um, redone and of course that's going to cost you more but it's important if you're putting a ton of miles in your boot, boots it's important at some point to get in there and, and get a new fresh layer of cork this to me i'm not for sure but this definitely looks like this is hot cork and so cobblers will there's two ways they can do it they can put like this hot cork which comes out like a paste and then they iron it I kind of like that because then it, it really gets into like every crack and crevice of, of that cavity. And that looks to me what like what they've done here. I, I'm not for sure about that. But they can also, cobblers sometimes would just use a, a layer of cork, of, uh, you know, a pre-manufactured layer of cork and put it on there. Both are fine. But you need to have that cork replaced every once in a while because it will eventually wear a little bit thin. So here I have, this is my used Thurgood 1957 boot um, that I bought. So I could cut a heavily used version in half. And you can see here this outsole is, is very, we'll set that to the side. This outsole here is worn pretty significantly. The leather is in good shape. We'll talk more about the leather here in a bit. But I want to focus on the cork here. As you can see, 
even though this cork is a very good material, this is like the, the best material you can use for a filler in this price range. It's still, look how thin that is now after all these miles have been put on that boot. And so, you know, when your boot gets in this condition, it's best to take it in, not just to get the outsole replaced, but to get in there and get yourself a fresh layer of cork put in there so you can get that resiliency back underneath, that extra comfort underneath the foot. And you don't have to do that every single time you get your boot resold. But, you know, I would, if it's me, like, yeah, every year and a half, if I'm using these, if I'm grinding on a job on these boots, like every single day, yeah, like it, that comfort matters obviously a lot. And that cork is very good at absorbing shock. And so a fresh layer or anything is very important. And I'm every year and a half or so going to go in there and get that, that cork layer replaced. Because again, if you can see there, that, that cork layer is pretty thin there. And it's not as thin as foam or cardboard. Cardboard and foam will smash so thin at times that it's like a sheet of paper. And, you, and that's definitely not like a sheet of paper. You still can see a layer there. And it's not bunched up, which is a good thing. It's, it's not clumped here. Because and, 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 if it starts to clump, you can feel that underneath your foot. So it's still evenly distributed across the bottom of the foot here. But it has worn thin. That's the used one. If I switch it out here. And again, if we compare that to that original layer of cork, you can really see that, that it has smashed down a little bit and that's again that's not a knock on throw good they're using in this price range this is the best filler you can use so they're doing all they can do it's just eventually it's important for you to get in there and, and to get that cork replaced if you plan on using these boots long term okay now we've discussed that cork filler and above that is the lasting board which is just very similar to all other lasting boards you see in these types of boots so we're not going to dive into detail there but Above that, of course, is another very important part of the boot as it pertains to comfort, and that's the insole. I just want to show you this version here that's cut in half, and, and if I can pull this up here out of the boot. So these are really popular. I recently tried 11 different types of waterproof mock toes, which, of course, this is a waterproof mock toe boot. And I thought these were the second most comfortable insoles out of all those 11. I think I thought the most comfortable were the Timberland Pro insoles. I did like this Thurgood 1957 boot better than the Timberland Pro boots, but the insole I thought was a little bit better. But this insole is very good. In fact, this is one of the things that, another thing that separates it from a cheaper boot. And this is one of the most popular aspects of this boot. And that is, it has these shock absorbing pads. You can see there that yellow pad, it's like a gel. It's underneath the toe, underneath the toe pad, and underneath the heel. Okay, guys, had to move the boot out of the back there so I could get this to focus properly. Here's a close-up look at that at that insole. So you see on the top there, you have that that foam layer, which is pretty common. A lot of cheaper boots will just use that foam material, so the entire outsole, or excuse me, the entire insole will be made of that foam. And I mean, the foam's a cheaper material, but it's very common in insoles. But what separates these is that, that sort of gel-like material there. You see it really good at absorbing shock. I'm hoping I can kind of capture that here. I can give you an idea how it would kind of function underneath as you put stress, impact stress on it. It's, it's absorbing that impact stress. And these are, again, I already set up, these are really popular. These these are people love these thoroughgood insoles and I like them too. So that's something that is a, a, definitely a thumbs up about this boot along with that cork filler underneath. But I do want to point out because I bought those used thoroughgood 1957 boots, these insoles, I know this isn't exactly breaking news, but they're not going to be indestructible as you can see here, get this to focus. And as you see, it's worn a pretty significant hole there in the toe. And that top liner, which I believe is a moisture wicking liner, so it's helping to pull sweat away from the bottom of your foot, it's starting to come off there. Again, this is extreme use. You know, this is not shocking all insoles. This is one of the first things to go on a, on a boot is the insole. But when we look at the, at the bottom here, those gel pads have held up nicely, a little wear there next to the toe. But as you can see that that shock absorbing 
part of it has really held up well, which is a, which is obviously a huge positive. But with like all things, you should try to swap out these insoles and pretty often, you know, I usually try to have two pairs of insoles on hand in case one gets wet. You need to swap out every once in a while just to let them dry. But replacing these insoles occasionally will be very important to preserve that comfort underneath the foot. Overall, this insole is a very good thing. It's a thumbs up. And this is one of the things that separates it again from those cheaper boots where they don't have those that gel underneath the toe pad and the heel and they just use the foam. This is something extra you're getting here with this boot. Okay, we're back on the outside of the boot here and this is my new Thurgood 1957 boot. You can see I put some use on it here. You can see the mud build up on the bottom, but this is one of my, my newer boots. And of course we've already discussed here underneath the boot the wedge out sole. We're talking about this wedge out sole a bit more later, but that rubber midsole we discussed. But above that, that brown layer here that wraps up with the stitches and then finishes right here, that's the welt. And there's good and bad things to discuss here. This is one of the few drawbacks about this boot is one of the issues with this. But the good thing, let's start with the positive, and that is this is a Goodyear storm welt, which is one of the best ways to stitch construct a boot. It makes it very easy to resole. It's a very dependable construction. It helps keep moisture out from underneath the, the bottom of, of the boot. And it's very easy for a cobbler to recraft. So that's a positive. The drawback is the material itself here is not leather. That is a synthetic welt. And synthetic welts just simply are not as good as, as leather welts. When they get exposed long-term to mud, you know, wet, dry, wet, dry, hot, cold, hot, cold, mud, they can fracture. And leather does not. Leather is so resilient that it can take on those changes in temperature and then mud, wet, dry, etc., and not fracture. Now, these synthetic welts, they're not gonna break on you in like two weeks. That's, and if it does break, you are still gonna be able to use the boot. It's just, you know, you just, you would have like a crack right here. And the problem with that is when you go in to get it recrafted, you're gonna to have to put a new welt on there if it's broken. Now, most cobblers that I go to, whenever I bring in thorough good boots, they automatically recommend me, even if this synthetic welt is not damaged or not, not uh, fractured, they'll say, hey, why don't I just put a leather welt on there? It's because then moving forward, you don't have to worry about it. Then you just have the better welt on there. It's, and so it's kind of frustrating that Thoroughgood doesn't just incorporate the leather welt. And I'm guessing it's a price range thing. You know, they probably want to keep this boot under $300. And so this is what they've decided. And again, this isn't a major issue. Like it isn't just going to like automatically crack on you, but it is something to consider because uh, some boots, some waterproof Mach 2 boots will use a leather welt here. And so this is one area that this boot is kind of, you know, giving something away. And if I pull up my pair of used Thoroughgood 1957 boots, so you can see here, I don't have any fractures, and this is cut, this is the one that's cut in half. So, but I don't have any fractures here, but I do have you know wear and tear for sure. It's it's been banged around. And you can just kind of see it's like I said. I'm not sure if that's a rubber if it's rubber based or if it's pla more of a plastic based. But I don't know if you can hear that. But it's you know it's definitely has wear and tear. When I've taken boots into a cobbler that are in this kind of condition they usually just suggest that i replace the welt now i don't necessarily think you'd have to replace this welt in this condition but they would just say hey let me upgrade the welt but it is going to cost you money and so if you eventually get this welt replaced and upgraded to a leather welt that's obviously going to add a little bit to the cost of this boot but again this i just want to use the or show you this used boot here just to show that I mean this boot has been put through heavy use and it hasn't fractured so it's not like it's guaranteed that this synthetic well is just going to fracture immediately or anything that's not the case at all but it is definitely not as resilient as a leather welt 
And so that's, that's a bit of a thumbs down here. It's one of the few drawbacks to this boot, but it's something definitely to consider. So I just brought in the other used boot I have, the Thurgood 1957. This one has not been cut in half. And you can see here, this, this welt is in, again, pretty good shape for being a synthetic welt. It's, it's definitely banged up. But there is no like major fractures or anything holding up pretty well. Um, I still would say that most cobblers are going to say, hey, why don't I just go ahead and upgrade that while I'm in there? But as you can see, it's it's not fractured. So that's that's a good thing, but it's still, it's just a cheaper well. And so overall, it's a, it's a thumbs down for, for that specific part of this boot. There's two main things that are very important to consider when buying a waterproof boot. That is, first of all, does it have a waterproof membrane, an internal membrane, which this does. That's this liner we see here. And this liner is what is actually going to protect your foot and keep it dry. It, something that Thoroughgood does here is they wrap this liner completely underneath. So it actually comes underneath your foot. Obviously, I've cut the boot in half here, but the insole sits on top of this liner. So some companies will like run it down the side here and then they'll drop it underneath that white lasting board and like stitch it underneath there. So it looks like it goes all the way underneath your foot, but it stops and you can't see it. Um, this is not what Thurgood is do doing. They're using a full liner here. They're actually wrapping it underneath your foot. So this booty is what's going to keep that water out. And how these waterproof membranes work is they have like billions of tiny little microscopic pores. And those pores are smaller than a water droplet. So the water can't get in. But they're larger than water vapor. So that the vapor, the heat can escape. This allows these waterproof membranes to be, I'll say, somewhat breathable. Now, at the end of the day, this is still an extra layer. And that's why I would always say to somebody, if you don't need a waterproof boot, if you don't need your boot to be waterproof, then, then don't buy a boot with a, with a waterproof liner in it because this ultimately is going to retain some heat. Even though they make these to be breathable, it's still an extra layer. And so if you don't need a waterproof boot, I'd probably recommend like the Thoroughgood American Heritage boots that are that come in unlined versions. But for the sake of this, you're probably interested in a waterproof boot. So it has to have this membrane. That's what's going to keep your foot dry. So I want to take a second here. I'll, I'm going to throw it up on the screen. I'll talk over it. But I tested this, this membrane by submerging the boot into a water tank for five minutes to see if it will hold out water. So let's take a look at that real quick. Okay, guys, so I did submerge these boots into a dunk tank here up to the second eyelet. Let them set in there for five minutes just to see if this boot would hold out the water properly with the waterproof membrane. And as you can see here, it is counting up to the final. I skipped forward here to the five minutes. After five minutes, I pulled them out and I had put tissues in there to see if those tissues would remain dry. And as you can see here, when I pulled them out, tissues were all good. So I'm giving the waterproof membrane a thumbs up. It passed the waterproof test. Now, the second very important thing to consider when buying a waterproof boot is the leather. And that how water repellent is the leather. Now, leather itself is porous. It's a porous material. So it can't ever be 100% completely waterproof. But how these companies make this leather repellent is they use premium leathers. And that is something that separates this boot from cheaper waterproof mock toe boots. When I recently tried 11 different types of waterproof mock toes, this was by far the best leather. And this is a, a bright, the boot that I own, it comes in, the Thoroughgood 1957 boots come in two different kinds of leathers. I have the Briar Pit Stop leather here, which is a chrome tan leather, and it's like heavily infused with oils, and you can feel it. It's, it's very flexible. It's soft. It's almost like no break-in period, and so that's a huge benefit of that oil as well. It's not only does it protect the leather, but it makes it softer, 
And that's, I think, the biggest thing that separates this boot from cheaper competitors is the quality of the leather. But that is really important for this boot because it's, it's in the waterproof vertical. And to be waterproof, we've already looked at the liner to, and seen that it properly holds out water, but it does you no good if the leather itself doesn't repel water. If, if the leather becomes soaked, even if that liner is protecting your foot, the leather itself can become waterlogged, which creates like a squishy, heavy boot. And can even like, then the water can get inside the leather. So like if you, if it's super, if it gets really saturated with water, you can get water like inside this layer here and it can work at this stuff and cause it to come loose. And, and even though this, this membrane, the membrane is keeping your foot dry, the water can settle in there if this, if this leather isn't water repellent, which it is. So you don't have that. That's not a major issue with these boots, but it is a major issue with a lot of the boots I tested when I tried 11 different waterproof mock toes. So that, is that water can get into that layer. And then not only is it just kind of can create like an uncomfortable feeling, but then the water like sits in here and dries. And that's when you start to get that like musty, moldy smell on your boots. So it's really important that the leather repel water. And so I've tested this and I, and I, uh, did a video of it when I tested it. So I'm going to pull it up on the screen. I'll talk over it. All right, guys. So I did drip test the leather here. Here is the Thurgo 1957 as I'm pouring water on it. As you can see, there's no absorption into the leather whatsoever. It's completely repelling that water away. And when I move the boot back and forth here, you can see that even if the water was sitting there for a little bit, it just repels right off. There had been no absorption whatsoever. Now, I did test a lot of waterproof mock toe boots. And if we take a look at some of these other boots, some of the competitor boots that I tested, as you can see here, there's instant absorption in this waterproof boot into the leather, which is obviously not a good thing. And then here is another name brand boot, just horrible absorption on this one. The leather immediately absorbs that, becomes waterlogged. And then here's a third boot. And this third boot here does repel some of the water, but definitely some absorption there. Now, if we go back and look at this Thurgood 1957 boot one more time on the screen now, you can see it's not absorbing that, that water. It's just repelling it away because of how heavily oiled the leather is. It's just premium leather that doesn't allow that, that water to, to absorb into the leather and become waterlogged. So if you're working in wet work conditions, um, in the rain and the mud, this is obviously a very important issue. And this Thurgood 1957 boot definitely delivers in a positive way. Now, I also wanted to test the laces because if your laces get waterlogged, that's kind of an issue too. Even if, even if it's a minor issue, it's uh, frustrating. So I put the laces in water for about five minutes and pulled them out. And as you can see here, when I Bring it to my fingers. There's a little bit of absorption there, a little bit of moisture. It definitely wasn't the worst. I tested a lot of laces and these were pretty good. I don't think I would recommend upgrading these laces. They're fine. That's what I'll call them is fine. Now, I think on Amazon, you can get like wax laces for about 15 or 20 bucks. If you want to like upgrade, I won't blame you. But overall, I think these, these laces are just fine. Another thing that needs to be discussed here uh, one of the final things it, for the waterproof is that it does use a, gu a gusseted tongue. And this is really important. You know, if the tongue wasn't connected there to the eyelet, uh, this has a name. I'm not camera what it's called. But if it wasn't connected here, then you couldn't run that membrane. See how that membrane's running all the way up there? So this is actually giving you that membrane protection up to that, like, third eyelet from the top which is important because if you do briefly submerge these underwater or something, then you have that, that you're getting protection up to, up to basically right up to there. And so that's an important thing. Now all waterproof mock toe boots are going to have a gust of the tongue. And this is actually very typical. Most of them stop like right in between the third and the second to the top eyelet. But this is an important issue and it does check that box. Another important thing about the quality of this boot 
that doesn't get talked about a lot is just the eyelets themselves. Most six inch boots have six eyelets. So as you can see here, this, this Thurgood 1957 boot is incorporating a seventh eyelet, which is important. Not only does it pass more, allow you to lace your boot a little bit tighter, passes more control to your foot, and also creates just a little bit tighter of a barrier there to keep water debris out. So that's a, that's a positive because this is an area that a lot of boots will try to save money. You'll even see some cheaper boots that are only for a six inch tall work boot will only have five eyelets. So they're definitely not cheating you here, which is expected at, at the $290 price range. But another thing that I really like about these Thurgood 1957 boots is they're using those three speed hooks. Most work boots, six inch work boots only use two speed hooks. Some cheaper ones will only use one. They're using three and that really allows you to quickly unlace it and give you that extra space to slide your foot both in and out. So that's, that's a positive. Okay guys, so we've talked about how premium, premium this leather is, but I want to specifically discuss how thick it is. As you can see, I measured the thickness of this leather at 2.48 millimeters, which is pretty thick. Anything around that two and a half millimeter range is, is pretty thick leather for a work boot, but it's very common up here in the 280, 290, $300 price range to see that thicker leather, which means it's more durable, it's longer lasting. And so if we compare the thickness of this Thoroughgood 1957 leather to the other 11 or uh, the other 10 waterproof mock toe boots I tried, you can see here on the screen, that Thoroughgood 1957 boot is one of the thicker leathers. Now, the neat thing about this Thoroughgood 1957 boot is the leather is so heavily infused with oils that it's still a very comfortable boot to wear. Like, it's not stiff on your foot, even though the leather is very thick. It's easy to walk around and move around in, which is a good thing, obviously. And it's very comfortable. It's easy to break in and very long lasting because of that thickness and the oil. But one thing it can do to the boot is that thick leather does add weight. See here, I measured, this is uh, my size 12 soft toe. I measured at 2.20 pounds per boot. So that's a little bit heavier. Again, when I compare it to those other waterproof mock toe boots that I tried, see on the screen here, it's one of the heavier options. Now for me personally, I didn't find this boot to feel really heavy on my foot. It's very comfortable to wear. To me, anything under 2.4, 2.5 is usually fine. And so the weight didn't bother me but it is a little bit heavier than other options, but that's typical for more premium work boots because the more money you pay, the better boot parts you get, the thicker the leather, the more quality material they use underneath the foot and that drives the weight up. But overall, I did not think these boots felt heavy on my foot. This boot has been used heavily and the outsole, as you can see, it is in needing of like definitely getting resold which is uh, very common, you know, that for, especially for wedge outsoles, they wear like this. But I just say that to kind of show you that that's a condition, that's the amount of miles that have been put on this boot. So let's take a look here. The, I think the thing that stands out to me the most about the condition of this boot is how good a shape the leather is still in. And you can see it definitely has bend points, which are impossible to avoid, but those flex points here, they're here and definitely the the major flex there right across the toe they're not you see how that leather isn't like cracking or flaking that is really a testament to how quality this leather is and how heavily oiled this leather is now it's important to always keep your boots leather or oiled regularly i try to use let's see if i can i got it over here i like to use this is the kind of oil i use i think this i think i get this for like 17 bucks ish um i always use this i just use like a toothbrush or something and regularly i try to oil my if you're like we already talked about how important it is for the leather itself to be water re repellent now even though the this leather on these boots comes 
it, when you get it, it's very he- heavily oiled. You need to maintain that by regularly oiling your boot. Now, you don't have to use oil. You can also use like a boot wax. Or you can even use waterproofing spray. I think waterproofing spray you can get for like less than 10 bucks on Amazon. And wax is probably pretty similar to that. Like I said, that oil, that boot oil that I use is, I think, $17. It, and the spray is fine. I don't like to use it compared to oil because you can't really like guarantee it gets down to every crack and crevice. And I like to let that oil kind of seep in. But it's important to keep your boot regularly oiled. Not only does it uh, maintain that water repellency for the leather, but that, of course, protects the leather. It keeps the leather moisturized and, and soft. And that's what helps maintain these boots so that they don't flake. But it also helps that this thoroughbred leather is, as we've discussed, it is a thicker leather than a lot of boots. And it comes, it's a premium leather that has a lot of uh, oils infused into it. So it helps it become, be a long lasting boot or leather. So that's a huge positive. Like I've said that throughout that the leather to me, this quality of leather is what really pushes this boot up into that $290 price range and makes it worth it. It's really what separates this boot. There's some other things that are very good. Obviously, the cork filler we discussed, but this leather is what really separates this boot from other work boots or other waterproof mock toe boots. And you can see that, of course, there's a, there's a little bit of damage here. You know, it's taken on an abrasion, a cut there. But the leather there, see how it's holding up so well, like right there. Like, you, I mean, if you look deep into that, there is just not, sorry, get out of the focus there, but there is just not any flaking there. I mean, it's just really in good condition still. A lot of miles left in this leather. And then, of course, I also want to discuss, um, you see there kind of the front, definitely some some bangs there, but the leather itself is just that, I mean, that is usually one of the first spots on a boot that just starts to go. And there might be just a tiny little bit there, but really holding up well, that leather is. And another thing to look at is just the seams. I mean, quality construction, like these seams are not busted. Not Honestly, I expected these both these used boots I have. I couldn't find any seams that were coming loose which is obviously a huge, huge thing. And you can get those repaired, of course, when you get them recrafted, but it's just extra money. And when you're in this $290 price range, I mean, you want to, this is the kind of stuff you want to see. You want to see that leather that's holding up really well. You want to see your seams hold up. I mean, what are you paying for? And that's, that's, that's what you're paying for is that quality of the materials. So a lot of good there. Again, we have we do have that synthetic welt which we discussed. That's that's one of the thumbs down here. But this leather is just premium. And then I wanted to specifically point out these eyelets here. No no loose eyelets, all in great shape. The laces are actually in very good shape too. But the eyelets, none of these speed hooks are loose, completely intact. Eyelets are in great shape. So really good material here. The collar. Um, Briefly, I should mention that the collar itself doesn't have any padding. One of the things I kind of don't like about these boots, but this isn't, I, th- I think the reason they're doing this is it's, it's, it's a traditional, like this is their 1957 series. It's like a heritage style. And it just didn't, you know, a lot of boots back then didn't have the padded collar. So they carry it forward here. I kind of like a padded collar, me personally, for when you're, you know, crouching, bending. But that's something to consider i guess if you need a padded collar you know you don't have one here but the collar itself is really maintained um and is in fine shape tongue's in good shape so overall this used boot definitely needs some love it needs a needs to get recrafted as i talked about with the cork filler me personally i'd get in here and have them just totally rip off outsole the rubber midsole get in there put put me down a fresh layer of cork and then recraft the boot so overall though i'm giving this out the outside of this boot the leather the seams the hardware a thumbs up okay so you can buy this thoroughgood 1957 boot in both a wedge sole version like i have or a raised heel version which one's best for you is going to be largely dependent on the type of job you have. The wedge outsole is really good at reducing impact stress because you 
have the entire bottom of the outsole impacting the ground. But um, there are some jobs that do need the raised outsole that gives a little bit of extra slip protection, especially if you're like climbing ladders. So which one's best for you will be dependent on the type of job you have. In this video, I'm going to focus on the wedge outsole since that's what I have. And this wedge outsole is a little bit different than the popular Vibram Christie outsole. This outsole is polyurethane based. It's called the Maxwear Wedge. That polyurethane based outsole is supposed to be a little bit more durable than the Vibram Christie, but not quite as soft. Now I would just caution you that in my experience, the difference in these two types of outsoles was, was really small. They're, they're very similar. This, here's the thoroughgood 1957 I have that's cut in half. Again, this is supposed to be polyurethane based, so it's not quite as soft as the Vibram Christie, but I just want to start out by showing you like there's still plenty of you know, squish underneath there. It definitely absorbs shock. So you're not talking about a stiff outsole. Um, it feels, to me, when I put it on my foot, it feels like all other wedge outsoles. So I can't sit here and just say there's a definitive difference between this and the Vibram Christie. Okay, guys, here's a Vibram Christie outsole uh, on a different type of work boot. And if I were to pull up that Thorough good Maxwell wedge next to it. You can see the design is very similar. Shallow lug structure as you expect on a wedge outsole. But if we measure the softness of these outsoles, we can see a little bit of a difference. So here's the Shore of the Vibram Christie, measuring about 53. And then if we pull that Maxwell wedge, Thoroughgood Maxwell wedge back in here. So we had a 53 on the Vibram Christie, and here we're up there around 73. So you can see there that there's a little bit difference. That Vibram Christie outsole is measuring as being a little bit softer, and this outsole is designed to be a little bit more durable. Again, it's it's very similar. If I show you again, it's just this is the Thoroughgood Maxwell wedge. Still very good at absorbing shock. It's just going to be a little bit more durable. Um, this is obviously to help it, the life extend on the actual outsole. But I still, you know, this is my used Thoroughgood 1957. You can see there's very typical wear here. This is what a lot of wedge outsoles look like. And so this polyurethane may extend the life of the outsole a little bit. I certainly won't claim that I've scientifically tested it. But I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of how Thoroughgood is positioning this outsole, this wedge outsole. And that is, it's, it's because it's polyurethane based, they're making it a little bit more durable than the Vibram Christie outsole, but not quite as soft. So that's, that's what you're getting with this wedge outsole. Another thing I want to mention about this wedge outsole is that it doesn't use a skin. So you can see, when I pull this up closer, it's just... If we go from the from the midsole all the way down, it's just one outsole there. There's no kind of skin down here along the bottom as an extra layer. Now, I want to pull in a pair of Timberland Pro waterproof mock toe boots I have here. And you see now their wedge out. So you see this skin they're using down here on the bottom. Uh, a lot of companies will use this skin. Some people claim that it adds extra durability to the bottom of the boot. I personally don't really like this skin because it's the first thing to come loose and it, a lot of companies will bring it up here at the toe so that it isn't as loose it doesn't come as loose near the toe there but I usually prefer what Thoroughgood has and that is just the entire outsole there is just the wedge outsole without any skin on the bottom uh, so I think this is a positive overall it's not really that big of a deal but uh, I think removing that skin does help extend the life of the outsole a little bit because those skins come loose so often. But the counter argument to that is some people claim that that skin on the bottom can actually help protect the bottom of the boot and extend the life of the outsole. So it's, it's definitely debatable. 
And I also wanted to mention that on this Thurgood 1957 boot, there is no stitching. This makes it a little bit easier to just simply cut off the outsole and glue on a new one when you need the outsole replaced. The downside is that there is no extra stitching there around uh, on the outsole. If you can see, if I bring in that a Timberland Pro boot again, you see how they've got some like extra stitching up here. That is to help this part of the outsole stay intact. Now, I've always been kind of a little bit I, these ex, the stitching on the outsole doesn't really do much for me because in the boots that I've had that have that stitching, I mean, once you put like six months of use on the bottom of an outsole, it's going to rip through all this stitching anyway. So overall, it's not really a big deal to me. I, I like how Thoroughgood has assembled this outsole. It's just a one piece wedge outsole, no skin, no need for stitching, makes it easier to get on there and just glue on a new outsole if that's what you need. And overall, this polyurethane based outsole is a little bit more durable than the Vibram Christie, even though it's not quite as soft, but it still is very soft and is, does a good job at impacting or absorbing impact stress underneath your foot. Did want to briefly mention here that this is my used Thurgood 1957 boot that the Thurgood 1957 uses a composite shank as you can see it right there cut in half. The shank in a wedge outsole, usually the shank is positioned right here and helps provide structure to that sort of arch part of your boot. And on a regular work boot, the arch doesn't impact, the outsole doesn't contact the ground, so that part of the boot often needs extra support. So in a wedge outsole where the entire bottom of the outsole is impacting the ground, this shank doesn't, isn't quite as important but it still is there to provide support. It gives you extra bang protection if you're like kicking a shovel all day long. It's, it helps to have a sturdy shank underneath there to protect the bottom of your foot. But I just wanted to mention specifically that they are using a composite shank, not a steel shank. You know, this is, the steel shank provides uh, extra protection underneath the foot, but it also adds weight. Some jobs can't have metal in their boots. So, you know, depending on what kind of job you have, this composite shank may be required because you might may need a non-metallic boot. I like composite shanks because they're still sturdy. They provide you some of that protection underneath the foot, but they're not as heavy and stiff as steel shanks. I like composite shanks. Overall, the shank is pretty low on my priority list on, on when I'm choosing a boot, uh, what type of shank it uses. Composite shank is absolutely fine. It's very typical in this type of work boot. Okay guys, so we've made it to the end here and really the most important question with any of these boot reviews is the question, is this boot worth it? And I'm going to say, yes it is, but with, with a little bit of an asterisk. And, and um, the thing you have to consider with these boots is the price. The price, I bought mine I think right at $290. There are many different styles of this boot like safety toe, soft toe, you can, as we've discussed, you can buy these boots with wedge outsole that I obviously own, but you can also buy them with the raised heel. So the price can fluctuate a little bit, but kind of in that $290 price range, and that's a, a pretty high price price range. And so it kind of comes down to two things. First of all, it's great to pay up for this quality because you're getting that just great leather. And when you need a waterproof boot, you need that quality leather. And so this is a huge selling point as we've discussed with these boots, is that is the quality of this of this leather and how heavily infused it is with oils it makes it long lasting. It's a thicker leather. So that's a positive. I love the cork. If I can pull that back in here real quick. We'll discuss the cork. This is a huge thing that separates it from cheaper boots and it's a very good material. It's much better than cheaper foams. And so that makes it worth it. You know, if you need that comfort underneath your foot, if you're just grinding on these shoes day in, day out, you need comfort. And, and you know, paying up for that can be uh, very beneficial, especially if you're somebody that has kind of grumpy feet. Getting that extra, that, more, that quality material underneath your foot, huge positive. The used boot that we looked at, you know, it held up really well. The leather um, is in great shape. The hardware's in great shape. But... The main issue with this boot 
it doesn't have anything to do with the boot itself. It's a great boot. I think when I tried 11 waterproof mock toes, I know that this was my choice for the best overall waterproof mock toe. My issue isn't with the boot. It's with waterproof boots in general. And that is, again, these waterproof boots are using, to be waterproof, they're using this internal membrane liner. These liners, Thoroughgood uses what is considered one of the best liners on the market. This is not a knock on Thoroughgood at all. These liners are not indestructible. They're just, think of it like a sock. You know, if you have a cheap sock, it's gonna, it wears out pretty quick. If you have a premium sock, which this is a premium liner, it is, it's going to last longer than a cheap sock, but it's still going to wear out because you're putting so much friction on these liners with your feet as you bend and move. And it just, just like a sock, eventually, if I can pull this up here in one second, this is the used, the inside of the used boot I have. You can see it right here, actually. See that? See that little wear there? And it's right on the cut line. That's, that's heel wear there. And just like a sock. And eventually these liners, they, get, they take wear and tear. And you know sometimes you can get it to form up here in the toe area and underneath it. But you know eventually you, you wear these liners out or the boot it could, itself could get punctured and puncture the liner. Whenever this liner, whenever the liner fails in one of these areas, then you no longer have perfect waterproof protection. And these, because these liners, you know, they're just not indestructible, they can't be. And the problem is this, with waterproof boots, the waterproof liner does not last as long as the boot materials, especially in these quality boots. Like this leather, this leather is good enough to last you like five to 10 years. Of heavy use it's a very good leather but the the membrane is not built to last that long and again that's not a thorough good issue that's just how waterproof boots are and so that's always the argument with waterproof boots if you want to spend up for these quality materials which they certainly are this waterproof membrane is not going to last as long as the boot and so let's just say that you do wear your boot for you know you know, let's just say a couple years and you put heavy use in it and you do like kind of wear it like this and all of a sudden it can get water, water can penetrate right there. Well, now you don't have a perfectly waterproof boot. If water, you know, if we're to get submerged and, and whatever, it would leak in through that membrane. So it just kind of comes down to at what do you do at that point? Okay, let's, let's just say that, that here's, here's what your boot looks like. It's in great shape. Well, you throw another outsole on here, your leather's in great shape but you don't have that membrane anymore. And so the argument that you have to decide with yourself there is, do you just go ahead and replace the boot because you need that perfect waterproof protection? Or do you keep using it because the boot itself, the other boot parts still have a lot of miles left in it? And that ultimately comes down to your own personal decision. Like how important is it that you have that perfect waterproof protection? But sometimes people, for waterproof boots will spend sort of like maybe less money than 290. Maybe they're kind of spending that 150 to 225 range because they're like, hey, this liner is gonna go bad on me. So eventually I'm gonna to have to replace this boot. So I'm not gonna necessarily, this liner isn't gonna last five to seven years, most likely. So I don't wanna buy a boot for that, you know, with thinking that I'm going to hold on to this boot for five to seven years. I'll probably have to replace this boot in a few years to replace that liner. So maybe I'll spend in that, in that cheaper price range, a little 150 to 225. So that's the argument to be made here. Is it worth it? It just kind of depends. Yes, this boot does separate itself 100% from other waterproof mock toe boots. It has better materials. It uses a quality liner. And the leather is exceptional. The leather is so much better than a lot of its competitors. I think if you're looking for the best waterproof mock toe you can buy for under $300, this is it. The problem, the argument comes down to whether or not you want to spend that much money on a waterproof boot because eventually those waterproof liners fail. And then you're left with a decision, should I, should I go buy a new boot so I can get that perfect waterproof protection again? Or do I just keep using this boot even though the liner itself is compromised? So that's the decision. I hope 
this breakdown of the Thorogood 1957 boot, which is a very good boot, very comfortable to wear, provides excellent waterproof protection. I hope that this gives you a better idea of what you're looking at and can help you make, make a decision on whether this boot is right for you. Thanks for listening.